since a young kid um, doing go karts. When I was five, I decided that for more one is the one thing that I want to focus my energy into, and uh, I want to success in, in Formula One. So, of course, very very proud, um, and and now um, as well, extending the contract with with Mercedes. Um, feel very proud to be part of the team again for fifth year consecutive and fifth year um, teammate of Lewis. So, yes. Um, yeah, proud. Well, just staying on that particular topic, the new contract for 2021 announced today. How much confidence does that give you? Well, for sure, it's nice to know you know what I do um, next year. Um, there was no really stress about it in, in any case, but um, it's just nice when it's done. Um, so yeah, it's it's good. I can focus on on racing, and that's a good thing. Thank you. And on that topic, Lewis, um, how important is it for the team that Valtteri is staying? Uh, I think consistency is always um, a good thing for a team. And, and Valtteri has had uh, such a, a positive influence on the team over these five years. He's, uh, he's trustworthy and um, does an, an incredible job on the track and, uh, and is a great teammate to all the people within the team. So um, I think it's a tribute to all the hard work he's done. Great stuff. Thank you. Let's go to the video conference next and to Andrew Benson from the BBC, please. Hi, uh, both of you. Uh, this one's for Lewis. Um, Lewis, have you started to realise the sort of seismic nature of what you could achieve this year, not just in terms of breaking Formula One records, but doing it in a, in a year when anti-racism agendas finally become high profile and in a, in a sort of momentous time for the world. Would it make this potentially the most important championship you've ever won, should, you've ever won, should you do so? Uh, well, I mean, I think it's the most important year of my life today um, with everything that's going on. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a different fight championship wise as to other years. Um, I mean, they're always different, but, you know, we've had obviously the years where we were fighting the Ferraris or the Red Bulls, it's, it's uh, slightly, slightly different up until this point. But, um, but I do think that there is, it is a special year, as I said, and um, yeah, I don't take that lightly. And people often ask where you, we get all our motivation from. I think there's so many things to, to take inspiration from and to inspire us. And, to be fighting for um, a championship in a time like this is is empowering and exciting um, with the thought that there could be change. When a tire is uh, worn terribly like the left front in uh, Silverstone, how does that feel in the cockpit exactly? And, and how much information do you get from your guys uh, at the pits? How critical a situation like this is? Yeah, I think it was it was difficult for everybody last week from within as a couple of drivers had I started experiencing a lot of vibrations you can sort of see the wheel not looking in the best shape uh, possible but from our side and I think as far as I'm aware from the other guys as well who had problems they they weren't actually in a critical state at the time so something else seems to have gone on there coincidence whether it's curbs or debris I, I don't know um, so I was I was actually quite fearful myself but having analyzed the data afterwards with our numbers we um, we weren't close to, to that limit yet so I don't know we'll see this weekend I don't expect to experience the same issues Romain you defended tooth and nail your position in Silverstone you got a warning by race control. I wonder, where do we currently stand uh, regulation or gentleman's agreement-wise regarding moving on the braking? Uh, well, it's a good question. And yes, I was defending as hard as I could. That's my job, uh, obviously trying to stay within the limit. Um, so it's quite, uh, quite interesting, the question, because two times actually the move were not on the braking. Um, they were still on the straight line. So I guess we were going into a different regulation. I had the chance to see the, uh, the footage 
And I do agree on, on Daniel as a move, a move to fair too late. I was always going to give the room for one car, but obviously he doesn't know that when I'm moving. Uh, but I, I moved too late and reacted to the right, um, and, and I was, it was a bit too late. On Carlos, I think he came on the radio and I don't know, we, I think it wasn't, wasn't that bad and there was plenty of room and uh, plenty of margins. So, yeah, I mean, you know, for us, it's not every day that we're in a, in a top five racing. And uh, as I say, I do my best for the team. I do my best for myself. And, uh, yeah, I felt, as I said, the second one was a bit marginal. The first one, there were plenty of rooms. Can you talk us through the accident with Alex Albon on the opening lap on Sunday? Were you expecting him to have a look there? And how big a hit did you have with the barrier? Yeah, so I got I got through uh, turn 17. Um, I got a little bit out of shape there, so I had a bad bad exit from there. Um, so I knew that, of course. But then, by the time I saw him come up, you know, by the time I saw his nose on my side, it was too late to leave that much room because the corner is, you know, turn 18, the last corner, is is you know fairly tight. It's just just about flat. Uh, so if you have to leave a car with to the inside on the apex there, uh, it will be tricky to make the corner. So, especially if you have to do it that late. So I think it was just like, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't say he deserved a massive, massive penalty for that because it, you know, I can understand why he would, why he would try in that in that situation. It was just uh, never really gonna be be possible. And also because I wasn't looking in my mirror at that time, you know, it's in, in an exit of a corner. And so I only saw him when I actually saw his nose, you know, on the side of my car. By that time, it was just too late. You're the only driver on the grid who's raced at Imola before. Can we get your thoughts on returning there and to the two-day format that is going to be introduced? I don't know how it works with the two-day. I, I don't know exactly the details of it, but uh, um, yeah, I don't... I'm not 100% sure if it's the same track exactly. I think they mostly should be, you know, obviously if they change the curbs and stuff, it might change also a bit on that side, but uh, I think it's missing a chicane in the last part, as far as I, I know. But um, yeah, I always enjoyed that. I, I always thought it's a nice track to to drive. I think um, the area is, is good, so it will be nice to go back to, you know, like Imola and Nürburgring, where we've been in the past. I think they're great tracks to, to go and uh, good fun to drive. It was a crazy weekend for you last weekend. What was the hardest thing for you to get your head around? Uh, it's just, you know, the, every car is kind of different. The seating position, the kind of noises, uh, every, every car has a different feel to it. And just, you know, coming in without any kind of preparation, um, really getting getting thrown out there. Obviously, I ran into the into the paddock 10 minutes before FP1, got changed, um, did the jump out test, and then I was straight out out there uh, doing a usual Fire Friday program. So uh, this together with, you know, just uh, learning about the car and obviously with higher fuel, with lower fuel, different engine modes, obviously everything I did was for the first time with this car. Um, so just, you know, adapting to it and then learning as, as fast uh, as possible. Nico did an incredible job just jumping in the car last minute and doing what he had to do. So, um, you know, we were we were we were focused and uh, you know um, we, our approach didn't change um, whether uh, Sergio was there or not. I think we we had a job to do and we tried to, to execute it at at our best. I guess you, together with the team and probably also with Pirelli, you had a closer look into the accident from last weekend. Can you give us some more details on what happened there? Um, yeah, so there was uh, some, uh, something gave up on the, on the rear right. And to be honest, we still don't know the exact cause of it. The investigation is ongoing. Of course, we want to understand completely the problem and so it doesn't happen in the future. So for sure we will uh, bring an end to this investigation. And uh, yeah, the fact is that uh, then once, uh, once uh, the puncture happened, uh, I was out of control. I was just a passenger in the situation. You described Grosjean's defensive driving as sketchy last weekend. In what areas was he sketchy and have you spoken to him? Yeah, so we, um, so I think sketchy most people understand, but it's, it's like sketchy, dodgy, a little bit on the edge, edgy probably. Uh, so, uh, well, yeah, we were called into the stewards after after the race to, 
to analyze it. Um, and at that point, I wasn't aware uh, of you know his move with Carlos as well. So it was obviously two two times which were a bit close in the race. So um, look, I didn't want to like he's been doing it long enough, and I think to understand. And I think when he saw the replay from our onboard, he understood that it was quite close and, and a bit late. So um, I think yeah, it's just about really for us drivers, you know you. I think in defence, you make your move, you know, you, you commit. I think re responding to the car behind is always a bit on the edge, you know, for the closing speeds and, and in, the, in the downforce, uh, in the slipstream, sorry. Um, the closing speeds are, are sometimes too much to react once they have. So I think really if, if you're defending, it's, it's really just about making your move first, making that clear, and then we go from there. So it's, it's just avoiding that, that grey area. Given the sort of ebb and flow of different levels of competitiveness from the teams and Ferrari struggling a bit, Racing Point not seeming to capitalise so far. Does it feel like third place is up for grabs this year and is that a, a target that Renault has set? Well, I think we, we are not at third place yet. Um, it looks like, you know, there are a lot of points to take at the moment. It looks like, you know, everyone is close to fighting to each other, which is good. Um, but that's not the position we have now. Of course, we are aiming you know, to move further up. Uh, we want to uh, do the kind of weekends and score good points, you know, race by race. Um, but yeah, I think it's going to be a long season. There's going to be opportunities to take. Um, and I think, yeah, um, if McLaren is third at the moment, it's, it's very decent. Um, and we are fighting with those cars on track. So, but we are behind at the moment, so we need to catch them up. How did you see Grosjean's driving on Sunday? Was it over the limit? Uh, yeah, personally, I think it it was um, unacceptable from from the driver's point of view when you are behind someone. Doesn't matter if you leave a gap on the right hand side, as he claimed he was leaving. I think you cannot react to a to a movement of the driver behind you. I think you you need to commit to your defense, to your line, and not react to the driver that is coming behind. And he was clearly waiting for me to make a move to, to cut me off the track. And I think that is unacceptable. I, if I have a chance, I will tell him. I think he will agree if he would have been in my position, although he probably will not admit it on the media. But um, we all know uh, over the speeds that we're doing in Formula One nowadays, and he probably knows that what he did is, is not correct. Has the bonus point for fastest lap been a good addition to Formula One? Without it, would there have been a stronger temptation for you not to pit on Sunday and potentially win the race? Yeah, but that's always afterwards, isn't it? That uh, potentially you would have won the race. Maybe I would have had a puncture in the last lap as well. So, Because looking at my tyre after the race, it was also not that great. So, yeah, I, I, uh, I don't uh, want to speculate about it. You know, it's what it is, and I'm happy with a uh, second. It was already a gift, because normally I would have been P3. So um, I think we did everything right to, to pit, to be sure that we wouldn't, we wouldn't get a puncture. And then an extra bonus was, was that uh, extra point. It was the second time this season you've had a, a collision with another driver uh, while attempting an overtake. Uh, obviously, the first one in Austria was deemed to be Lewis's fault. Have these incidents made you think any more about sort of your approach when it comes to overtaking on track and maybe timing moves? Kevin suggested that if you'd have been a bit more patient, that you'd have got the move done fairly easily anyway. No, I wouldn't change how I've, I've approached my racing. I think, um, yeah, there's there's been a circumstance with Lewis, but that's just racing incident. And even to me, on, with Kevin's one, it, it could be the same thing. It, it's It's also, to me, part of... The crash itself. Um, I mean, Kevin made a mistake and he left the door open. So it's there's definitely, of course, the, I, to me they're both racing incidents. Um, but how I would approach racing? No, I think all this patient stuff. It's you. I mean, we're we're trying to get points and we're trying to go through the field. So um, I could be patient and wait three laps to get past them, or I could do it when when I know I can. And I went for it. It didn't work, but uh, I wouldn't regret doing it again. Formula One photographer Mark Sutton revealed this week that he saw you and Otmar Safnauer leaving the track together after last Sunday's race in Otmar's car. Is that correct? And if so, where were you guys heading? It's correct. So we're heading to the fuel station. And after the fuel station? After the fuel station, he was going home and I continued uh, going somewhere else. But you were in his car? Yeah. 
I was. It's a nice car. I mean, it's a Ferrari um, Pista, and I remember years ago he was, uh, you know, talking about that car. Now he, he obviously got one, and uh, he said that he ran. He's running out of fuel. I said, "Well, where are you going?" And we're heading in the same same direction. And then, uh, yeah, I was going with him to the fuel station, and then went somewhere else. Christian Nimovol at motorsport.com has asked, is it fair to assume that racing for Aston Martin in 2021 is still very much a possibility? Well, I've got lots of op 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 possibilities, uh, maybe not so many in Formula One, as you can do the math and see which seats are taken. But uh, I think, uh, as I've always mentioned, I think the most important is that I'm happy with my choice and time will tell what the choice is and then go from there so I'm not uh, too stressed about it. It looks like the pace isn't the only issue with this year's car. It looks like it's pretty difficult to get it into the sweet spot one weekend. One driver is pretty fast, the other one is pretty slow. The next, the next weekend it's the other way around. So is it more difficult to get this year's car into the sweet spot than it was in the previous years? I don't think it's harder than other years. Um, I was personally not very happy with the way I worked uh, with a build-up uh, uh, in the Budapest weekend um, but overall otherwise apart from my mistake in Austria the second race I don't think the pace was so different in in between uh, the the cars so no I don't think it's any more uh, uh, difficult